restaurant, a wellness facility, and and yeah, that's where I've been ever since. And that and then that became a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a huge project. Yeah, and then I got kind of lost in that and lost in the material again. So uh -huh. it really is a balance. Yeah, and I can see it being a cycle too, kind of. It seems cyclical, like most things in life. Um, you know, like when I was traveling, it was so pr like um, present. Like I was just there and I and I was I didn't have anything to like worry about in the future, you know. You like, didn't have uh, distractions from your daily life and your job and your responsibilities, you know. Exactly, exactly. And and you know, then when I when I started to get the itch to come back home, now now I've been back working and I've been working a lot because um that's just what I do. I'm extreme about most things. So like now that I'm working, I'm working like constantly, all the time, every day. Um and it's been like three or four months now that I've been back working and I'm already starting to feel like like I find myself going to like literally look at Costa Rica, like the flights to Costa Rica and then like price Airbnbs and be like, hmm, if I if I had like this much money, I could fly to Costa Rica and stay there for like six months for like this amount, and like you know, like uh, kind of make these like these partway plans. But uh, I'm actually going back to Brazil for like 10 days. Uh, in a month so that that'll kind of like cure the itch a little bit nice i've been wanting to go to brazil and do like a two-week portuguese class and then travel a bit yeah yeah brazil is it was lovely uh, i i like it there portuguese is so weird though it's a it's a difficult one for me i would say if you know if you know your spanish which i'm assuming in costa rica you probably got a kind of probably got a decent handle on spanish you can hold your own like you can understand portuguese um eventually not right off the bat because it does the root is very similar but it sounds spoken like it sounds weird but yeah uh, you, it's you beautiful get... beautiful language um so yeah i mean in the beginning i was traveling sometimes with no money whatsoever because i was determined to prove that i didn't need to follow the rules and that they didn't apply necessarily it wasn't the real world, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> well, it seems and like your experiment worked out pretty well, though. <laughs> it did. And I, and I mean, of course, there was a lot of ups and downs uh, traveling with no money uh, and, but, and flying by the seat of my pants. But then that's where the balance came in because eventually I did study massage. And then I would, it sounds like, what you're doing is I would go home just to work, 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 work. And I was living in Alaska, which was also mind blowing. And I loved it there. And I, you know, felt like I was more connected with nature. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just work to save, to travel. And I would yeah. leave for three months, six months, and then come back to work, to save, to travel. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've thought about living my life that way. And it's, it's always on the table. Um, right now, I'm planning to actually bring my girlfriend from Sao Paulo to America. So that's going to kind of change my life dramatically. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We're working it out. That's a whole logistical nightmare just to actually get someone here from Brazil and, and like to live. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, Right. With we, COVID, er, too, that complicates everything. Eh? For sure. Brazilians, she can't even come to America right now. Like, Brazilian citizens, the border's closed to Brazilian citizens. Hence why we have to meet in Mexico and I have to go to Brazil, which is fine because, I mean, like, I'm not mad to go hang out in Mexico and Brazil. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, it's kind of expensive, but, you know, like you said, that's why I come and I grind and grind and grind and then I sta I just save my money and then... I can travel when I want because that's really what I enjoy doing, you know. Um, throughout my life, I've enjoyed doing a lot of different things, but travel has become like paramount now. Um, and it, it's become paramount in part because of my career and like it my I can do it, you know. Like most people who are working, you know, when I was a waiter, just making a little bit better than minimum wage, it was, I couldn't travel. Like I'd have to save all year to go like on a one-week vacation you know, just to some tourist trap. I couldn't just leave and go, you know. But I, but it, I kind of had to prove that, like you're talking about, I had to prove it to myself that it could be done. And 
I did. I was like, okay, I know from now on in my life, if I need, if I need this relief that I can do this, you know? Yeah, I think by not falling into the trap of all the things you need that, that you want or you have to have, you can keep your expenses really low and live a simple life. And it's, and this is what millennials are figuring out. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're probably. This is why I live in a. This is why I live in a fucking garage right now. <laughs> well, and my husband and I did the same. We lived in a hut while we built our first hotel room, and then we lived in that hotel room for five years, and then we lived under our yoga studio in what I called the bird cage. And <laughs> nice. We lived simple, but we could go travel in the off season and live in paradise you know yeah. hell yeah that and you and so like was it your idea to do all this was it your husband's was it a group effort like how did you find the right person to undertake this like seems like it would be difficult to find a partner who who's like into this, this yeah uh, it concept. took me quite a few tries <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, me too, me too, still working on it. <laughs> but, you know, it was that moment when I was like, okay, F this. I don't care what anybody else is doing. I was in Ecuador by myself and, and tired of traveling by myself because it is more difficult and it does get lonely, you know? I was planning on, like, circumnavigating all of South America and then I spent, I don't know, two months in Costa Rica, two months, which is not South America, two months in Ecuador and was like, oh, God, it's a 17-hour bus ride just to get to the border of Peru. <laughs> yeah. Know? I did that a bunch of times. <laughs> <laughs> and so I volunteered a bit and I stayed there a while. But then I was like, you know what? I don't care what anybody else is doing. I'm just going back to Alaska to work and save to buy a little piece of property down here somewhere. Yeah, that's a great idea. And it was um, in that letting go of when I met my husband and I was like, oh, you don't want to get involved with me. I'm relocating to Central America or Latin America. <laughs> so you met him in Alaska. Mm -hmm. and, and your plan was already your plan was already in place. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Everyone always assumed like that he was the instigator or, you know. Yeah, 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 I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> nope, he got on my plan. Yeah. And and that's kind of one of the things that I, you know, that, that my girlfriend now, we're, we're working on building a future. And, and, and in my mind, this is what this is the way it would play out. Well, she, you know, she's multi-degreed, multilingual, so she can do well for herself here in America as well once she gets in, in a position to do so. Um, I have a pretty solid career also. I'm like, look, we can grind here in America and, and start our life for, you know, a few years, five, seven years. We have a little nest egg built up by then, which is very possible if we keep our cost of living low. Then we can go back to Brazil, or we can go, you know, elsewhere in the world because she's she's spent time in various parts of the world also, so she's kind of uh, lived a nomadic life as well. Um, and, and so relocating is not such a big deal to her. Obviously, she's willing to come to America, so uh, that's kind of what I see on the horizon. Like I, I think you know, a, a few years here in America working hard equates to a good future elsewhere in the world um because you know it's it, the cost of living compared america is so opulent and extravagant and unnecessary and like that was the thing that struck me as soon as i got off the plane back in america i was like what the fuck like this is crazy and, and it's uh like something you touched on earlier was i had just been in places in the world where people didn't have any of the things that we need in america like you just, like, you don't have a car? Well, no one has a car. You just walk and go get on the metro and ride downtown and get off and walk. And, like, it's okay. Here, it's like, you got to have a fucking Tesla and you need a new iPhone and you got to have, like, you know, everything. And, yeah, there's uh, so much excess is what I notice when I go yeah. back. And it's interesting because... In Panama, thrift stores don't exist. Food banks don't exist. Like, that's excess. 
Mm-hmm. That's abundance. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. There's so much stuff that we're like, it's spilling over. We have garage fulls of things we don't use and we're just giving things away. And here everything gets used. Everyone's so resourceful and they make do with what they have. Mm-hmm. I joke and say, yeah, I'm Michelle, make do Miller. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's funny the things that happened to me on that trip. Like there was one time where I had, because I could only, I took only what I could carry inside a backpack. So I only had a, a limited number of articles of clothing and a limited amount of anything that I didn't buy along the way. So my clothes, I would recycle and I would wash them and... Uh, I was with, I made a friend in Colombia, and my clothes were dirty, like all my clothes were dirty like on a Sunday. And all of the lavanderias were closed on, on Sunday. Um, so I was like, what am I gonna do with my clothes? Like they're dirty, I don't have anything to wear. And she's like, just wash them. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean wash them? I don't have a machine, I can't wash them. She was like, what are you, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, she, I got hands. <laughs> yeah. She was like, just get some soap and water and wash them in the sink. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so I was like, you're right. You're absolutely right. I could just fucking wash my own clothes and it'd like hang them up to dry. And it was like, it, it was such a funny moment because to her, it was like, you fucking idiot. You know? <laughs> yeah, why would you think of that? <laughs> Yeah. And to me, it was like, it took me, you know, I had to be coaxed into the idea of like washing what my own contrast, clothes. huh? Yeah, yeah. And so that's like the like, most basic thing. Yeah, yeah. Just something simple like that, you know. And then I've talked about on my other episodes, like my, during my travel, it's a rainy day in here in Texas. I don't know if you can hear that coming through, but. Oh, yeah. It's a nice little afternoon rain. Just give a little ambiance to the listeners. <laughs> But uh, I also had some experiences where I was like the minority, you know, where I was um, not in a position of power. And in America, as a white man with a decent job uh, and, a, and a, you know, a family to support me, I don't ever feel, you know, I, I never have to feel like that, that I am out of place, that I am um, – under scrutiny just because of who I am, where I'm at. And that happened to me a couple times in my travels and it was very uncomfortable and I didn't like the feeling, but it, it, it was, it was good experience for me because it kind of like opened my eyes to, I was like, man, there's people in America who feel like this constantly all the time. And there's people all over the world who feel like this, that live their life under this kind of stress. I'm like, man, that sucks. And I and I don't know if that's possible for me to have experienced that here in the states. <clears throat> so yeah, a- for me it goes it goes both ways, right? It's like, um, pe- if you're white or you're a gringa, I'm a novelty sometimes of where are you from and let me help you. And you know, in these government offices, sometimes they'll move things through quicker and friendly, whatever. And then there's also the gringo tax, right? Where we have all the authorities at our business asking for our paperwork and our permissions, and they're going to give us fines and they're looking for bribes or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Whereas the people that are from here don't get that kind of attention. <laughs> yeah that makes sense um, it goes both ways for sure yeah and I've never been to Panama I think I said Costa Rica earlier because we were talking about Costa Rica but you're in <laughs> Panama Yeah. Um, I've never actually been there but uh, it also kind of depends on where you land you know like uh, I was in Mexico City with my girlfriend a couple weeks ago and it was so it seemed so hard edged and like so unfriendly to tourists or to gringos and uh we just had like several instances of like really weird things and like it's kind of left a bad taste in her mouth in particular. For me, I was like, eh, you know, this shit happens. Like it's part of it. It just is what it is. But uh, she was like, I don't ever want to go back to Mexico. And I was like, uh, like Mexico is a wonderful place. Like, yes, fucked up things happen there just like they happen everywhere. But it's all OK. Well, um, it's interesting because, and I think because of my use of psychedelics too, is that I would start to wonder, like, 
okay, am I creating this because of my expectations and so it's mirroring back, you know, or is this, is there a reason why I'm not supposed to go to Mexico? I'm supposed to go somewhere else. You know, I always go deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> always questioning, no. like. <laughs> I, you know, my use of psychedelics has brought that to into my into my life as well. It's like uh, sometimes when when things are seeming to when the, when there's a lot of resistance, like it's a, it's almost a balance of understanding like resistance. Like yes, there resistance is necessary. We need to learn to 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 overcome challenges, but also kind of an intuition about when the resistance is a little too much, and it's like okay, maybe I need to like alter my course and go a different way so yeah i think about that too i'm like is this really like if it's if it's this difficult is this really what i'm supposed to be doing um and yeah you yeah. kind of gotta yeah. tell that line yeah i get into that with my husband a bit because i'm really intuitive and i'm like well no obviously we shouldn't be here we you know all the signs are saying we should go somewhere else we should do this and he's like let's make it happen yeah yeah <laughs> See, and I'm kind you know, of like that as well. And it well. becomes a dance of like, well, how do you know when to listen to your intuition? I'm like, no, just listen to my intuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and you know, I spent I spent so much of my life like in that mindset, and it's effective. It's effective to be a bull. That make it happen, make shit happen. It is. It, it's it's like being a bull in a china shop, you know. And if you just don't take no for an answer and you just push through and make it happen no matter what. There's something to be said for that, but that's also exhausting to live your life like that. It's like... Well, and here's the dance because it's also like, okay, you want to make that shit happen, but maybe it's not happening because something else completely unexpected and even bigger is in store for you. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but then it's also kind of like you're like, well, you know, just on the other side, you know, because like that that mentality has worked for me a lot. Like when I when I drank ayahuasca the first time, I mean, I was so fucking scared and I was like, dude, just stop being a bitch and drink and just shut up. And so I did. And it was terrifying. But then afterwards, I was like, oh, my God, thank God. I just like I just pushed myself over that boundary, you know, that I just went through that barrier. And the uh, same thing when, when I when I smoked toad, I was terrified and I was just like struck grappling with like trying to not do it. I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And finally, the 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 server, uh, whatever you want to call him, he was like, dude, you need to stop thinking and talking so much. Be quiet, breathe yeah. in, and take this hit. And when it's over, you'll thank me. And That's I was your like, mantra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was That's like, funny. okay, dude, uh, I'm going to, you're the expert. I'm going to trust you. And then, of course, when it was over, I was like, oh my God, dude, thank you so much. That was fucking beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find it interesting. Like the things that we're most scared of, those are usually what we need the most. And I found it interesting, like, just in society in general, like, and with the worldview of psychedelics shifting now, too, it's like, you know, they were bad, bad substances. I was crazy for going and living, if I, you know, living like a poor person in Central America, and no one could understand, and it, it's like those things that we most are afraid of have the most medicine sometimes you know mm -hmm. the stone yeah. that the builder refused yeah 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 <laughs> for sure to quote that that's a bob marley lyric right I mean, yeah it comes in the bible kind of, yeah that's kind of an old proverb yeah yeah for sure mm -hmm. cornerstone. Love it. yeah <laughs> um yeah, it, it's funny people like what you say about go go live like a poor person. I'm like, bro, when I was living with quote unquote poor people, like life was dope as fuck. They weren't like always bogged down by going to the office. Like Saturday and Sunday, they're having a good time. They go do their job. You know, Monday Monday through Friday. It's, it's similar to in Brazil, similar to the American style, but it's just more relaxed. They're not like 
They're like, eh, if I'm late to work, it'll be okay. Like, I need some more sleep. Like, I'm like, okay, cool, man. Like, I- I'm early to everything. I'm like, you know, you just, you-, you get so neurotic about, like, these things become so important, so overly important. And, uh, yeah, yeah the, the psych- lack of organization here is what makes people more relaxed because it's kind of like, yeah, they say a lot like, si Dios quiere, if God wants, like, God willing, I'll be at work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. Because they just know, like, there's too many unknowns. The power could be out, the, you know, traffic can be ridiculous, there could be a strike, like, there's yeah, just too many unknowns. You, and yeah. they do, there's more religion here and more trusting God of how everything's going to work out, which yeah, I really yeah, like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I dig that too. I dig that too, and and I felt that a lot in Peru as well when I went there to drink ayahuasca. And and something you said early on when we started recording was that the psychedelic experience kind of led you into this uh, down this path. And I know for me that's definitely what it was. Like, it, it's funny. I, I've talked about this before. People and I was talking about this last weekend with my friends and family. It's like uh, there's this stigma around drugs and the it, you know especially in America, people think they're bad and, and you're getting high, you're wasting your life. I'm like, bro, I was in a, a lost shithead before I started using these substances. Yeah, and- I want to stop calling them drugs. I want to start calling them substances or psychoactive substances. Yeah, yeah. Or, I, don't, yeah. I don't like to call them drugs either, but I'm saying no, just, just the kind of... let's keep drugs for pharmaceuticals, the, you know, the real drugs. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, but but I, I use that term as in like just kind of the the American right. That's the view, concept. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we call these 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 just horrifically addicting, uh, brain altering uh, drugs. We call that medicine. It's so fucking weird. Yeah, like, pharmaceuticals. <laughs> yeah, and there's some great pharmaceutical drugs. Don't get it wrong. I work in medicine, but uh you know prescribing Adderall to like half the population of America and children I had a lady come in one time and I was triaging her child her her seven-year-old child and I said is he on any medication regularly and she said yeah these and she pulled out a plastic bag and held it up to me and I said what are they she said I don't know I don't know he, his doctor said he needs them so I took the bag, I Googled the pill on my pill idea, and it was like 15 milligram Adderall. I was like, ma'am, you don't even know your child is on an amphetamine? Like, you need to know what this shit is, dude. Yeah, that was pretty- Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Um, that, a roundabout to get back to what I was going into. <laughs> um uh, yeah, ayahuasca was kind of the thing that cracked me open. And, and after I, after I drank ayahuasca, it was like, I got to get out of here. Like, I, this is not enough, you know. This is not what I'm looking for. Just grinding all the time to, I don't know. I, I had goals and, and ambitions and things. But after ayahuasca, they seem hollow. They just seem like, like not important anymore. Well, that's the thing, right? About once you go so far into the spiritual, it's hard to take the material as seriously, I think. Mm-hmm. It's I- definitely a balance. And yeah, it requires like admir- love and admiration, I think, for the ordinary as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. You can't just be on that ayahuasca or that uh, mushroom state of mind constantly. Although that might not, I, I don't know about I, like uh, high dose ayahuasca, but like a, a like a medium. Uh, when I was younger and experiencing, <laughs> with, like, you're gonna say like, yeah, you can be on a medium dose all the time. Like not, I I wouldn't say ayahuasca because I mean I, I don't know about you, but ayahuasca for me was a, is a horse of a different color. DMT is a different substance for me. But like when I was younger and starting this experiment. And I would take low dose or mid range dose of psilocybin, like a gram, a gram and a half, and I would be I would be in that realm, but not like head first diving in. Um, I would think a lot. I would be like, wow, this almost seems like the way that I'm meant to be perceiving, like as if this uh, mushroom has 
t- like unveiled my eyes and it, it almost I, I would have this sense of nostalgia that seemed like this is how it, it was supposed to be well Stanislav Graf says that he thought psychedelics may have the ability to exteriorize otherwise unseen forces or energy meaning we may not be hallucinating we may be seeing what actually exists but we don't normally notice under regular circumstances or maybe it's affecting our brains in another way to where it's giving us superpowers <laughs> yeah it does and seem I, like that i think it's interesting that we haven't gone that route yet with research maybe it's like a little too much you get to have to take baby steps but like the MK Ultra and that kind of stuff in the beginning, the government was on to something with like the superpowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And like there's so much weird stuff coming out now that like I hear all this stuff about DMT and there's the government is trying to utilize like long term uh, DMT exposure to communicate with, you know, if you've ever smoked DMT before, then what? Would you know what Terrence McKenna called the the machine elves or the entities? <clears throat> if you get a good enough hit of DMT, you're gonna encounter things that seem to be intelligent and <clears throat> maybe not uh, humanoid, but uh, uh, possibly humanoid uh, um, entities is the best way to describe it. If you've ever, I haven't, but I've heard so many accounts of the same thing. Yeah, it, well, it definitely happens, and it can be you know it can range and vary. Some one time I've seen like a, it seemed like an entity made of matri- green matrix code, and he was like throwing this code at me, and it was like, and it was just like pouring into me this like green matrix data. Um, one time it was like this guy with long arms, and he was like dropping these balls down these tubes, like his arms were moving so fast, and he was just like smiling at me. It's like one of the jester uh, archetypes. And then one time, so one see, time, it's all leading towards like, yes, there are other entities and other forces at play. Yeah, yeah. And some of them are really fun and like kind of like, I mean, I'm speaking specifically to DMT I, during smoked DMT because during the ayahuasca experience, it was much more like extended and like, um, like the entity, there were other entities that were moving around me and entering my my field but like my grandparents were there with me um like it seemed like my physical grandparents were there with me at least in in spirit but they were it was so real that like i could just look up and they were like right there standing with me and they're all they've all they're all dead at that point and uh and then there were other entities that were like not good and they were moving around like i could see things like loping around the room like and as people were purging and it was fucking crazy but uh mm. yeah yeah that's the thing <laughs> i heard uh, your other account about communicating with everybody in the room too yeah and i think yeah. it does induce like these paranormal even gifts you could say right psychic abilities and enhance different things like that which to me has stayed with me like certain things my intuition or like premonitions of somehow being able to predict the future or just kind of comes naturally to me to where I'm like mm, nope that's not gonna happen this person's gonna do that or you know? yeah yeah <laughs> like, just it, like the sixth sense yeah it does almost seem like a <clears throat> you know it's like uh practicing or like a training working out it's like almost like a muscle you can flex, and if you work with it, it it kind of it gets stronger and stays with you. It comes out of the realm of the esoteric and into your everyday life. Um, but you know, I would have never even understood that that was a thing. Um, actually, I never would have believed it until ayahuasca, and I had been tripping for years before that. But I just never kind of I had never gone over that threshold into like the the true what seemed to be like the true uh gateway like to really pass through to the other side um 
And I would have never believed that shit. The same shit that happened to me, I would have been like, okay, yeah, sure. Uh huh. You drank some tea in a jungle and you had telepathy and you could see the future. Yeah, okay. But after I came out, I'm like, okay, well, uh, that just happened. Like, <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'm trying to communicate <clears throat> all of that in my book in a fun way with like a rolling narrative where my crazy character like i said is like renounced society threw her wallet in the forest and now i'm moving through the world trying to make life happen for me in 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 an alternate reality or lifestyle that i haven't quite found yet <laughs> yeah you yeah know? I wanted, so it's a I wanted, quest <clears throat> i wanted to get into your books you're writing a you're you've written or are writing a series of books yeah, I've and written the first book about four times. <laughs> everything I've ever written, I've written fucking dozens of times. Yeah. Oh, and congratulations. I heard you say that your writing was accepted on the, was it Woody Creek or Woody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it's really public... cool. Yeah, for me, that's a super high honor because Hunter S. Thompson is like a, an idol of mine and, and a lifelong inspiration, so... That's to me like the pinnacle of my writing career, if you want to call it that. Yeah, and I want Heart First is the name of my series. I want it to be in that same vein. But to me, there hasn't been a female counterculture novel or memoir yet that really reflects that. And I mean, clearly, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so it will be like <clears throat> 90s counterculture. And there are some self-published stuff that I see coming out now that's exciting. But the mainstream has not received anything like that yet, unless I'm, I'm missing something. So I've really been trying. I'm, yeah, I'm no. trying to get it traditionally published and see if I can deal with tradition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> there's some so I'm sure you've already researched all this, but there's some self-publishing options on Amazon, things like that. You should you should look. I I would um, look into doing like an audiobook version, something like that, like recording it yourself. That would be really Ew. cool. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but uh, no, I, I think you're right. I we have Thompson, we have Kerouac, we have McKenna, we have all these kind of uh, you know Leary. We have these psychedelic figureheads but they're all men they're all you know they're all explorers and important but uh i'm trying to think of of a, of a yeah female. Leary's. i think she was his ex-wife or i don't know the mother of his children but she, and she's deceased now but they just published a book called psychedelic refugee that's a compilation of her stories and her writing and that i haven't read it yet i need to because um, it's definitely a comparative title in, in my genre. But that's exciting. I mean, she is kind of the diva, the psychedelic diva from that time. Sure, sure. So it, you, you said you're going to, you, you're writing your story as kind of like kind of in a gonzo journalist style where it's like slightly autobiographical, but maybe slightly embellished, but mostly true. Like, is that the kind of route you're taking? No, it's definitely personal memoir. Okay. Um, and it's less like abstract. Is this really happening? You definitely know when it's drug induced and like what the reality of the situation is. Uh -huh. But it's very comical. Like I see the humor and in my ridiculousness of some of the stuff I was doing. You know. Mm-hmm. So taking people along for the ride, more or less, of what it was like um, traveling with no money whatsoever and just putting my faith in the universe, um, even through Mexico and Central America. Um, yeah, Alaska it takes place in Thailand, too. Wow. Yeah, I that spent sounds a lot of like a Alaska. hell of an that sounds like a hell of an adventure. <laughs> yeah, I, you need to get that published. I want to read it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I've been trying to sell it at <laughs> first, uh -huh. you know, and I've learned so much about the industry. I first started pitching to agents like two years ago, 
And that was probably my second draft. And now I've refined it and I'm fine tuning it and I'm pitching right now. Um, but I'm still always polishing and, and changing things. And then mm -hmm. if not, then it wasn't meant to be. And I'll definitely self publish and that will be quicker. And I will have all the rights to the name and to my content and all that. So maybe that, that is what's meant to be, but yeah, I'm not super familiar with the way that publishing works right now. I've only been published in like magazines and, and smaller publications, usually through like contests, things like that. Um, some of my publications are specifically related to plant medicines. Um, but I really don't know anything. And I'm, I'm planning to write a novel. I've gotten a, I've, like I kind of write in bursts like a blog style, but I have like so many of those that I could easily compile them into like a, I've had the thought to, to, to write it in a no, novel, novel style, like to compile them, but to create a, like a intertwining narrative, kind of like what you're talking about. But I've also had the idea of just to like put them all into a volume and like release the volume like mm -hmm. that. Um, but I have no idea how that I would even accomplish that, you know, like. it is such an art <laughs> and I'm, I'm learning so much and really appreciating it. And it's just so hard to stop because I am an artist, um, in this, in my other life, other, other life. And with art, it's always like, you know, you tweak a little here, you do a little there and then you go, okay, that's enough. I don't want to mess it up or, you know, do too much. And with writing, I'm like, no, and then I can add this there, and then did I already write that? And then it's it's hard to leave it alone, I've found, because I also know it keeps getting better every time and every draft. Mm -hmm. And so I'm almost afraid to, like, stop and just publish, because I yeah. know it's only going to get better. But at a certain point, you just kind of have to go, okay, enough. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, is the story that I want to tell for this novel finished or is the story still ongoing? And uh, I'm not sure. So I'm going to just keep like, and I haven't been writing since I've been back in America. I haven't been writing much at all. Um, my, the li my lifestyle on the road was so conducive to writing. It was so inspiring every day. I had something to tell, something to write about. And, you know, a lot of my a lot of my impetus for writing was that I would write in blog style because I was writing on Facebook on my personal Facebook page. And I've done that for years. And then after I came back, I was like, dude, I don't want to be on Facebook anymore. Like, I just don't want to be on social media anymore. I just kind of lost. <clears throat> there was like months where I had no cell service. My, my phone just went out so I could only use Wi-Fi. And I got used to not constantly scrolling social media and stuff like that. So when I came back to America, I was like, uh, I think I'm just going to deactivate my social media. And that was kind of like a, a, a driving force for me to write because it come, I guess for me it came from some subconscious want to be like noticed or like uh, uh, maybe not even subconscious, maybe fully consciously. I wanted <laughs> yeah. to people to like think, oh, you're a good writer. Like you have so much like profound shit to say. And now I'm like, well, if you have so much profound shit to say, then just write a book. You don't have to, like, tell everybody, like. <laughs> yeah, you know? good for you for getting off Facebook. Yeah, and it was kind of hard, but it's been very rewarding. Now I can't imagine going back to it now. It's been, like, three or four months. And now I'm just like, fuck that, dude. Like, I, I just don't see ever doing that again. Yeah, yeah. all that can become a real time suck. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So... You've gotten your first. You've gotten your first uh, portion of your series written. Maybe still in the editing phase. You know, every time I read something of mine, I want to edit it too. By the way, that's just kind of like the writer's curse. But I also have gotten to the point now where, like, I'll kind of hammer it out. Then I'll go back and edit it, and then I'm like, okay, leave it alone. Like, uh, you're gonna change, and you're gonna read what you wrote, and you're gonna have changed since then. So you're not going to agree with certain things or you're going to think this could be better. But it's also like a snapshot of who you were at that moment. So I don't like to alter it when I'm too far removed because I kind of don't have the grasp of who I was then anymore. Does that make sense? 
Yes, but in my case, I'm having to go back and put myself in my 19, 20-year-old position back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah, And right yeah. from that perspective. And I'm always thinking of more stuff or like present day stuff that I know now, especially about psychedelics, that I could plug in. Because the whole time I'm kind of questioning throughout the narrative of like what's happening to me. Because even though my friends were using these substances, no one was taking this radical approach that I was hardly. It wasn't until I started like, talking to homeless people and like really hardcore hippies that I was like, oh, okay, somebody gets me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, wait, why? <laughs> so I was lacking a lot of support and a lot of understanding g growing up and being different. And now I'm trying to bring in what I know now into mm -hmm. it and even mention like well this was before the secret and before instagram quotes and all this stuff like i had no idea why I, all these synchronicities were happening to me and everything was seemingly working out for me like mm -hmm. multiple times every day <laughs> you know? yeah it was also <laughs> like uh I, I, my 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 the beginning of my exploration was a little bit later than yours i was like Let's see, I graduated in 2007, so it was like probably 2008 when I took like mushrooms for the first time, 2007, 2008, and uh, there, there was no integration, like that word wasn't even yes, real. Yes, thank like, you. That was like <laughs> that was me just, and my... That was less than 10 years ago. Yeah, that was like me and my friends like were... Like set and there. setting, I mean, I know yeah. Leary said that a long time ago, but that was not on my radar. <laughs> oh, not for me either. It was like... That's me and my friends sitting in our tiny little duplex, taking acid, smoking cigarettes inside, like just yes. savages, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, totally. And my friend's like, let's go to the gas station. I'm like, fuck no, dude. You're going you're gonna to drive right now? No, dude. No way. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the dichotomy of like then versus now, you know, with the, with the advent of the internet, and I remember, like, when I was in college around that time, 2008, I was trying to do, like, a mescaline extraction on my back porch. Like, I was out there in, like, my boxers <laughs> with, like, those fucking, <laughs> like, elbow-length yellow gloves. Like, with, like, I don't even remember, some dangerous chemicals. That's was, funny. Yeah, I've got some stories that haven't even made it into the book. Like, we were slicing poppy flowers in front of a church. With a razor blade and trying to get like the opioid or the liquid from the poppy. <laughs> uh, no, people do that though. People go like sleep in poppy fields and I don't know how they do it, but they do it. But yeah, like I remember at the end of my little mescaline experiment, mm -hmm. I had two I had two big horse pills full of this dark brown powder. And my friend was like, I'll take it. I'm like, holy shit, bro. I I cooked this shit up and I don't think I'm gonna take <laughs> <laughs> your own risk and then we both took it together and like nothing happened so i fucked it up somehow <laughs> anyways <laughs> yeah but uh it, i've talked about that before coming up in that time is like right around when the internet was starting to uh just emerge and uh yeah, there was no integration. That's just like no, no integration, no googling, no even real communication, regular communication with my family or anything because there was no email. There was no, it would have to be a phone call, you know. Mm hmm. And there so, was no, there was no like, uh, there was no when I when we started, there was no spiritual aspect to it. It was brain candy, and it was, like, intense, and it would take you to some crazy places, but it's just like, dude, I was tripping so hard last night, bro. Now it's like it's taken on this whole new bent, you know. Um, See, I me. think the majority of people that were doing it with me, that was kind of their experience, but I was having more of a spiritual experience and realizing, like, no, wait, there's more to the Matrix, you know? And that mm -hmm. was what was really puzzling to me and part of my struggle is just like, why am I the only one? And of all my yeah. friends, they're still in college, they're still, they can do the grind. Why am I the one that just can't swallow the conformity pill, you know? 
Yeah, that can be alienating. I can see how that can be alienating for sure because it's alienated me, you know. And I've still, I've still, for the most part, lived a very safe American life. You know, I've did every. It started off rocky. Um, I tried to be a nonconformist, like punk, uh, when I was younger, and and then I realized like it was more punk to kind of like twist the system and use it to my advantage and like really live the life I want to live. <clears throat> and uh, I, you know, I, I kind of developed this outlaw style of life where. I compartmentalized like my career, my education, and like what I actually wanted to do, which what I, what I actually wanted to do is explore psychedelics and counterculture and uh, other other ideologies, other religious uh, thought and and all these other you know weird shit, basically. like I like conspiracy theories and the occult and high strange and and just anything weird, yeah, uh, supernatural, yeah, but I had to. I thought I can't go, I can't delve headlong into that side of life. Um, I mean, like you did. Maybe that was just uh, that that kind of. Uh, I was just holding back, you know. But I was like, I want to create a life where it's where I can go to work, make my money, but then I compartmentalize my personal life so people don't bother me, and I could still like live this kind of like underground outlaw. Uh, That's life. why I'm so excited about this book because to me, everybody wants to quit their day job. Yeah, true. So just read this crazy story about the psychedelic chick that did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you I mean, know? And that sounds like fun, you know? It sounds like a, a, I think people will find that very entertaining and fun. And it's, I, I always love a good adventure, you know? Fucking, what's better than like Indiana Jones or like. List, reading Terrence Indiana McKenna. Jones with some psychedelic insights. <laughs> yeah, that would be more fun. Exactly. And that's that's what you've created here in, in your series. So that's what I'm uh, trying. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? You I mean, obviously I want you to like uh to, to plug all your stuff and tell people where they can find you, but is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to discuss? No, you know, I just I hadn't realized really until the internet and until podcasts like yours and more discussions started coming out maybe four or five years ago about psychedelics. And also when I went to do my yoga teacher training, um, I, a light came on for me that, oh, like you forgot that those substances were the catalyst, probably the catalyst for you know, all your exploration. And so it's been really interesting to me, like learning more now of how those substances affected my openness, personality trait, and how, and, and understanding myself a little bit more with all the information that people are sharing now. So that's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I thank agree. you. I love how you share, like, the psychedelic news. Oh, cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because otherwise, I mean, I, okay, I'm someone who turned off my television and stopped following regular media almost 30 years ago. Good for you. You're not and missing so, a whole lot. <laughs> no, I get my info off my spiritual Instagram quote. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Those are always those are always info, legit, by the way. <laughs> yeah, off my psychedelic podcast. So I love when you share the news. That's about the only news I get. That's cool. I'm glad you're the only person <laughs> who's ever who's ever given me feedback on the news. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So, yeah, I mean, other than, I mean, how people can support me would be to follow my Heart First series either on Facebook or on Instagram. The more people I can show that are interested in the book, the greater chance I have for a traditional publisher picking it up and publishing it. Um, but again, if that doesn't happen, you just would know when I finally do self-publish if you're interested in reading it. Follow me there. And I also post lots of these little insights and funny I don't know, little psychedelic memes and things that are related to the book. So it's very lighthearted and, yeah, inspirational about following your heart and following your dreams. 
That's dope. That's dope. I'll, I'll link all your stuff in the show notes so people can find you. Well, Michelle, it's been great chatting with you. Uh, thank you for your insight and your the charmed life that you've chosen to live. It's, it's <laughs> it, it, it is an adventure and it's inspiring. And, uh, you know, people like you are what drove ha, have inspired me to not only experiment psychedelically, but to travel and things like that. And, and I'm so thankful that I've come across people like that in my life because um, it, traveling and, and seeing the world is, I to me, the most important thing. Like, we're only going to be here for a little bit, you know, and I want to see as much of, I, like, I've seen enough of the inside of uh, emergency rooms and, and restaurants, waiting tables and shit like that, you know, like, there's a lot more to see out there. Um, so people like you are very inspiring to those of us who want to live like that. And to those listening, you can do it. Michelle is an example. Uh, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a short. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a you. short. Yeah. Keep on following your heart and the rest will follow. Absolutely. I, comes. I agree. I agree. So thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, we'll see you around. Okay. Thank you, Clinton. All right. Take care. Nice to meet you. You too. All right. Bye.